Hey, what's up guys, this is Matt with The Movement System. Chances are you already know a lot about traditional strength training methods, but what you might not know as much about is eccentric overload and flywheel training. So in this video, we're gonna break it down in detail. First, we'll cover the science, how flywheels and eccentric overload works, why it matters, and when to use it. Then we'll explore the unique benefit of flywheels, such as if they can reduce muscle injuries. And then finally, we'll cover the specific protocols for eccentric overload, including volume and frequency, so that way you know exactly how to implement it into your training. Big thank you to Eccentric for sponsoring this video. More on that later. All right, let's dive into the science. Flywheels work in a way that's unlike any other form of resistance in the gym, but the basic mechanism is actually pretty simple. You can think of it sort of like a yo-yo. With a yo-yo, a wheel moves up and down while the string winds and unwinds. A flywheel works the same way, just the wheel stays in place and the string moves in and out. And it turns out that whenever you have a really heavy yo-yo and a really thick string, this can actually become a great form of resistance for training in the gym. Instead of lifting weights up and down like a barbell back squat, you accelerate a rotating disc building inertia. And inertia isn't just a good name for a fortune teller's daughter, it's a scientific term for an object's resistance to change its motion. Here's the key. Once you spin a flywheel up and you build inertia, you have to decelerate against it to slow that flywheel back down. Take a squat as an example here. On the concentric phase, your muscles shorten as you drive up. On the eccentric or the lowering phase, your muscles lengthen as you control the way down. With a flywheel squat, you start by giving the cord a small windup and then you drive hard into it, unwinding it and spinning the disc and creating inertia. That energy comes right back to you and it takes the exact same force to slow down the flywheel through the eccentric phase as it did to speed it up through the concentric phase. Now here's why this matters. When you lift traditional weights, you're limited by the mechanically weakest point in the weakest phase of the lift. The weight that you choose has to be light enough to go through the sticking point on the concentric phase of the lift, even though your muscles are capable of producing much higher forces in other positions. For example, your muscles can typically handle about 140% or more of your concentric max force production through a controlled eccentric or lowering phase. But with barbells and dumbbells, you almost never tap into that potential because the load is the same in both directions, the concentric and the eccentric. Flywheels change that. Since the resistance is based on the energy that you put into the concentric, the harder you drive up, the more force you have to absorb on the way down. Furthermore, rather than only producing max force at the sticking point and then coasting through the top of the repetition, you can actually produce max force into the cord throughout the full repetition. So studies like this show us that you can actually load the eccentric phase far beyond what you'd get with a fixed weight. That's what makes it true eccentric overload. And the technique that you use can make that eccentric overload even more substantial, but we'll get into that later. To summarize, if you had two athletes and one of them was 40% stronger than the other, you wouldn't have them squat the same weight. But that's what you're doing when you use the same load on the concentric and the eccentric portion of the rep. A flywheel is one tool that allows you to tap into that true eccentric overload and get closer to training at your full eccentric strength capacity. Now let's move on to why that matters physiologically. And here are a few reasons. First, the eccentric forces are a strong stimulus for fascicle length change. Studies like this show us that repeated high force lengthening tends to increase biceps femoris long head fascicle length, which is linked to lower hamstring strain risk. And this is a good time to mention, I'll leave a link to all the studies that we reference in this video in the description below the like button. Okay, second, studies like this show us that high force is required for tendon adaptation. Tendons don't adapt gradually across a spectrum of loading, but rather there's a certain threshold of about 70% of your maximum force that is required to elicit adaptation. I've measured 70% of max force on force plates in my gym, and it's a lot harder than what most people think. So while you can get there with isometrics or with regular traditional lifting, eccentric overload is one way to basically guarantee that you're reaching that loading threshold. And that's why there's a good history of eccentric loading improving tendon strength. And then third, eccentric overload recruits high threshold fast switch motor units. This can improve braking coordination, 
strength, and speed. There are obviously a lot of benefits for athletes to get stronger fast switch motor units. Okay, but with all that said about the benefits of flywheels and eccentric overload, it's important to know when to use it. Here are a few good times to implement it. One would be late off season when building size and strength. Eccentric overload is very taxing, and studies like this show us that it is likely to cause a temporary decrease in jump height and sprint speed. This typically lasts around 48 to 72 hours after an intense eccentric overload training session. Now in the off season, this is no problem because athletes are building size and strength to compete at the next level, not performing in a game or a race that week. However, around competition, you may need to use more caution with implementing eccentric overload. That said, I still think there can be a place for this with preseason and in-season training. This study is a good example of how implementing eccentric overload one to two times per week for 10 weeks in a soccer preseason can reduce hamstring injury occurrence over the next 10 months. It can also potentially be included in in-season maintenance programs especially if players have a history of hamstring strains. One specific exercise that I saw in the research for hamstring eccentric overload was this straight leg drill. I tried it and it was tough. Basically you use an ankle strap and you lay down in front of the rack and then drive the leg down using the glutes and the hamstrings. The harder you drive down, the harder it pulls your leg back up. And it's a great way to build strength all the way through a lengthened position. It also has the added benefit of improving hamstring mobility at the same time. Now this one does require a rack mounted flywheel, which makes this a great time to thank our sponsor Eccentric, who made it possible for me to do all the research and the testing that went into making this video. I've been wanting to make a flywheel video for a long time, and the one thing that I noticed doing my research was that build quality is really important for a flywheel. Because the wheel is spinning around really fast and you're putting so much force into it, the components of the flywheel have to be really high quality. And that is exactly the case for the eccentric K Pulley Go Plus. This rack attachable flywheel is built in Sweden, and as soon as you feel it, you can tell it's built with premium materials and design. If you're familiar with Aleiko, then you know the quality of Swedish training equipment. The K Pulley Go attaches easily to any rack with a convenient magnetic pin that comes in one inch or 5 8 inch to fit any rack. There's also a strap mount option so that you can attach it to a tree or a pole to train anywhere. You can add up to four flywheels, giving you literally unlimited resistance. The new addition that makes this the K Pulley Go Plus is the built-in power meter. There's a lot of evidence that giving athletes objective feedback each repetition immediately improves performance. So I think this is a really great addition. You can just pull up the Eccentric app and choose what metric you wanna see and you'll get immediate feedback during the set as well as data to view and save after the set is complete. The Eccentric K Pulley Go Plus really is an incredible training tool that can take your training to the next level. Check it out in the link in the description below if you wanna learn more. Thanks again to Eccentric for sponsoring this video. Okay, so now let's move into some specific exercises and training protocols that you can use when training with a flywheel. Now, although there are various protocols out there that can work for different phases of training, athlete populations, etc., I wanna share one specific example that I think can work really well in a lot of different cases. And that one involve a training volume of three to six sets with about six to eight reps per set. We wanna keep the reps low around six to eight because that keeps high tension and effort every rep. And that is essential for flywheel training to be effective. And anywhere from three to six sets can be appropriate depending on the phase of training, the exercise, and the goal. But what about training frequency? For this, I would recommend two to three sessions per week for about five to 10 weeks. More than three sessions per week targeting the same muscle group could lead to overtraining or a progressive decrease in intensity. So that's sort of the upper limit. And then one session per week could be a good maintenance dose in season. But for the five to 10 weeks in the off season or the preseason, two to three times per week frequency is a really good target. Okay, but how much resistance or inertia should you use? While there are some specific guidelines out there, here's what I'll say to keep it really simple and make sure that we understand the main principle. The bigger the flywheel or the more flywheels, the more time under tension. So you can manipulate any exercise based on what you're trying to train. Lower inertia will leave less time under tension and more speed for training power output or higher inertia, more flywheels, 
for strength and hypertrophy and more time under tension. Basically, if I do a row with a small flywheel, I can pull really fast and produce potentially more power output but less total force. Or I could add more flywheel resistance for more time under tension and higher force output, but potentially a little bit less power. And the good thing about the Capoli Go Plus is you can actually measure this and look at your force output or your power production. In any case though, I think it's important to always train with max effort. If you pull the pulley slow, it really won't provide much resistance. You could do 20 reps and it will just kind of be like a yo-yo. But if you're pulling it as hard as you can and getting that true eccentric overload, that's when you're gonna get a really good training stimulus from it. So whether you have high inertia for strength and hypertrophy or lower inertia for faster speeds and more power output, you still want high effort to try to move it as fast as possible. If the pulley takes a lot of time to build that inertia, that's fine, but you still wanna be giving it max effort. For even more eccentric overload, you can try a technique that involves basically ripping it up and then catching it late explode through the concentric and then delay the braking about a quarter of the way down and create a sharp eccentric peak. This is a great way to work on that fast rate of force development and eccentric overload. Creating those very fast braking impulses is great for carrying over to improving your change of direction. And again, I can't emphasize enough, make sure that you're keeping your sets short and high intent so that the wheel keeps biting. If intent fades, you'll underload that eccentric component. You've probably seen a lot of exercises that you can do with a flywheel throughout the video. Torso rotation is great. You can do this with a bunch of different apparatuses to add on to it, or even just doing it with the classic handle. Training the rotator cuff with a flywheel is way better than what you can get with a band. A high pull is a great exercise to try. RDLs are great, especially with high inertia and creating that strength and hypertrophy stimulus. And of course, rows are a really great option as well. And this is really just a small taste of what you can do with a flywheel. Scrolling through the Eccentric app gives me a lot of ideas of what to test and train next. I hope this video was helpful for you. Thanks again to Eccentric for making it possible, and thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.